What on earth is this strange musical contraption? And what the heck does it have to do with the Fibonacci numbers, modular arithmetic, and the pigeonhole principle? Well, all of these secrets will be revealed in due course as we explore the Fibonacci music box. The Fibonacci sequence is one of the most well-known numerical sequences in mathematics, in part because of its simplicity. Starting with the numbers 0 and 1, we generate each new number by taking the sum of the previous two. It's a great sequence. Top notch. Anyway, the Fibonacci numbers and closely associated golden ratio have taken on a kind of mystical significance in pop culture, so it should come as no surprise that people have tried to make music from them. One approach I saw in a pretty popular YouTube video was to read the digits of each Fibonacci number from left to right, interpreting each digit as a scale degree. We then add lush harmonies, and, as I understand it, the secrets of the universe are revealed. Here's the problem though. This is pretty much just random number music. I talked about this at length in my video called The Problem with Pi Music, but the basic issue is twofold. First, the Fibonacci digits arranged in this way behave statistically like random numbers. And second, given the arbitrary nature of the musical mapping and the accompanying harmony, you can pretty much make the music sound however you want it to. So how can we do better? How can we make a Fibonacci music where the essential Fibonacci-ness is highlighted rather than obscured? Well, to start with, let's acknowledge that it's understandable to focus on the digits of the Fibonacci numbers, because if we were to map the numbers directly to pitches, we'd end up with something like this. So this idea of playing the digits doesn't come out of nowhere. It's a way of dealing with the exponential growth of the Fibonaccis and limiting the output between 0 and 9. The problem lies in concatenating the digits and the randomness that results from mixing up all of the place values. But what if we were a little more selective? For example, listen to what happens if we pick just the first digit from each Fibonacci number. As you can hear, there's now an interesting dynamic at play. We never go from a 1 to a 5, or a 2 to a 9, because the next Fibonacci term is always the sum of the current term and its predecessor, and the predecessor is always smaller than the current term. To visualize the difference between concatenating and taking the first digit, Let's take a look at a graph of the digit transitions, first for the concatenated digits, and now for the first digits. You can see how limited the possible transitions are. Anyway, interesting as this first digit pattern is, and if you know more about it, please let me know in the comments, the path to our Fibonacci music box lies instead with the final digit. Take a listen. Did you hear it? It's repeating itself. The final digit of the Fibonacci numbers follows a repeating cycle of 60. This definitely deserves some investigation. To understand what's going on with these looping final digits, we first have to talk about modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic is essentially the arithmetic of remainders. So, say you have a number like 25 that has a remainder of 1 when you divide by 6, and you have another number like 9 that has a remainder of 3. When you add these numbers together, you end up combining the groups of 6 from both numbers, and then combining the remainders, so that the resulting number, 34, has a remainder of 4 when we divide by 6. Notice that what happens with the remainders is pretty cleanly separated from what happens with the groups. For example, if we instead add 13 and 15, which have the same remainders of 1 and 3, the result of 28 still has a remainder of 4. The idea of modular arithmetic is to pay attention just to the dynamics of the remainders and not to the groups. We say that the numbers 7, 13, 19, and 25 are all equivalent to 1 mod 6 because they have a remainder of 1 when divided by 6. Similarly, 9, 15, 21, and 27 are all equivalent to 3 mod 6 since they have a remainder of 3. And whenever you take any number equal to 1 mod 6 and add it to a number equal to 3 mod 6, you get a number equal to 4 mod 6. Now sometimes when you add, the remainders spill over. For example, a number equal to 4 mod 6 added to a number equal to 5 mod 6 
results in a number equal to 3 mod 6, since an extra group of 6 can be removed from the combined remainders. But the point is that none of these results depend on the full sizes of the numbers being added. All that matters is their remainders under a given divisor, also known as a modulus. So returning to the final digits of the Fibonacci numbers, we can understand the whole process in terms of mod 10 arithmetic. The Fibonacci's mod 10 start, as usual, with 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. And then when we reach 13, we simply remove the multiple of 10 to get 3. Then 8 plus 3 is 11, and we remove the multiple of 10 to get 1. We then get 4, 5, 9, 14 becomes 4, 13 becomes 3, and so on. Notice that at every step, if we compare the sequence to the sequence of final digits of the Fibonacci numbers, it's identical. The only difference here is that we're removing multiples of 10 as we go, rather than in one fell swoop. You still may be wondering what all of this has to do with the cycling property of the final digit. Well, to understand that, we're going to have to talk about pigeons. There's a principle in math called the pigeonhole principle, which essentially states that if you've got a finite number of pigeonholes and a larger or even infinite number of pigeons, at some point you're going to end up with more than one pigeon in the same hole. In the case of the Fibonacci numbers modulo 10, since each new number is based on the pair of numbers that precedes it, it makes sense to consider the space of possible pairs of numbers. And because the modulo operator is limiting us to the digits 0 through 9, there are now only 100 possible pairs of numbers. 100 pigeonholes. But since our pattern goes on forever, we have an infinite supply of these pairs of numbers. An infinite number of pigeons. This means that eventually we must return a second time to the same pair of numbers. When this happens, we can't help but go in loops because the whole process is deterministic. If 5 and 9 lead to 4 the first time, they'll lead to 4 the second time, and the third time, and every time after that. There's a beautiful way to visualize this process. Each of our pairs of digits, representing the previous and current Fibonacci numbers modulo 10, can be plotted in a 10 by 10 grid. We start at coordinates 0, 1, the seed numbers for the Fibonacci sequence, and then proceed to 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 5, and so on, proceeding through each adjacent pair in the sequence. Eventually, we can't help but return to the initial seed. And so it loops, again and again and again. By the way, there's a little detail I'm glossing over here. The pigeonhole principle guarantees that we'll return to some point in our path a second time, but not necessarily to the initial seed point. For all we know, we could end up with something like this, where an initial segment of the path gets orphaned from the part that loops. However, it turns out that we do always return to the initial point, forming pure cycles. Why is that? I'll leave this as an exercise to the comments section. But as a hint, it might help to consider the exact moment where the path seems to fork, and why such a moment cannot exist. Before we go any further, let's play around with adding some sound to this beautiful diagram of ours. Personally, I like the way that it sounds if we map each dot to a note on the marimba, with the pitch being determined simply by the current value of the sequence, or the height of the dot. Of course, the pattern comes across very differently at different speeds. Here it is fast, very fast, and very slow. Then of course there's the question of scale. What you're hearing right now is a mapping to the chromatic scale, where each number is a half step higher than the previous number. But we could just as easily use a major scale, a harmonic minor scale, an octatonic scale, or even an overtone series. How do these different scales impact the way you hear the distance between successive numbers? And how do the different speeds affect your perception of the patterns of the loop? It's worth keeping these questions in mind as we explore further. Once you start applying the modulo operator to the Fibonacci numbers, you can't just do mod 10 and leave it at that. No, the only real path forward is to build a web app that allows you to try all sorts of different choices of modulus, and see what kinds of patterns arise. One interesting example from a musical point of view is the Fibonacci numbers mod 12, since in traditional western music there are 12 notes in the chromatic scale. Just like with the Fibonacci numbers mod 10, 
The idea is to proceed through the sequence, subtracting off multiples of 12 whenever the numbers get big enough. Let's take a look at this on our Fibonacci music box. As we've already discussed, this makes a cycle. But interestingly, even though 12 is bigger than 10, the cycle it forms is shorter, of length 24. So of course you know what we have to do. We have to try every different possible modulus and see what kind of cycle length we get. Let's take a listen to a few of them. Now you know that something this interesting has got to have a name already, and it turns out that it's called the Pisano period. Traditionally denoted pi of n, the Pisano period is the period at which the Fibonacci numbers modulo n repeats. Wikipedia actually has this interesting chart showing the Pisano period for the first 10,000 values of n. There turn out to be several interesting properties of the Pisano period. For example, if m and n share no common factors, the Pisano period of their product is the least common multiple of their individual Pisano periods. The Pisano periods for prime numbers also seem to play a special and central role, which shouldn't be too surprising given that this whole thing was about divisibility in the first place. Anyway, I say all of this to pique your curiosity, and if you know any more about this, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. There are two key defining elements of the Fibonacci sequence. The recursive definition, that each term is the sum of the previous two terms, and the initial pair of seed terms, which in the case of the Fibonacci sequence are 0 and 1. However, if we change the initial seed terms but keep the recursive definition, we can get a whole family of other sequences. The one you're most likely to be familiar with is probably the Lucas numbers, which start with 2 and 1. Of course, you can play the modulo game with the Lucas numbers just as easily as you can with the Fibonacci numbers. And to hear them on our Fibonacci music box, we need only begin from coordinates 2, 1. Ah, but why stop there? Every point in the grid is part of some loop or another, and we can explore them all. If we color each point according to the cycle it belongs to, we see that some values of the modulus, like 11, feature many distinct cycles, whereas others, like 7, feature relatively few. There are also some patterns. For example, the point 0, 0 is always its own lonely isolated cycle, since 0 plus 0 is, and will ever continue to be, equal to 0. Also, the horizontal axis and vertical axis are colored in the exact same pattern, because the sequence k, 0 is always followed by 0, k. Similar correspondences can be found throughout the grid if you look carefully. Another point of interest is the upper left-hand corner. Compare the original Fibonacci sequence to the sequence starting in the upper left-hand corner. Did you hear it? They're inversions of one another. If the inverted path doesn't look quite right, that's because this diagram doesn't really capture the cyclical nature of the integers mod n. In a tessellated diagram, you can see the relationship between the main cycle and its inversion much more clearly. Also, in this tessellated diagram, there are other ways to draw both the original Fibonacci cycle and its inversion. But why does this upper left-hand point form an inversion of the Fibonacci cycle? Well, for the Fibonacci numbers mod m, the upper left-hand corner represents a starting point of 0, m-1. But since m-1 is equivalent to negative 1 mod m, it's as though they're starting with 0, negative 1, which will produce an inverted Fibonacci sequence. That said, why is it that for some modulos this inverted cycle is distinct from the main Fibonacci cycle, whereas for others it's joined with the main cycle? Same with the Lucas numbers. For modulos 3 and 6, the Lucas numbers and Fibonacci numbers are part of the same cycle. Are these the only cases where they share the same cycle? 
And more generally, how many distinct cycles are there for a given modulus? And what governs the lengths of all these cycles? I don't know the answers to these questions. So if you have any insight, or if you have any other questions that I haven't considered, leave a comment so that we can all learn together. And if you want to explore these questions audio-visually, or just want to play around with all the musical patterns, I have a link in the video description to my Fibonacci Music Box web app. One of the things I hope to convince you of with this video is that math and music are ultimately both spaces in which to play, and I hope that this app allows you to play musically and mathematically at the same time. By the way, if you enjoy the intersection of math and music, in addition to the video on Pi music I mentioned at the top of this video, there's also one on a mathematical approach to meter that I'm quite proud of. Finally, it goes without saying that I'd encourage you to like, subscribe, and if you're able to, join my Patreon. For this video, patrons received early access to beta test the Fibonacci music box, as well as a link to an experimental version featuring MIDI support. In addition, I've made patrons a behind-the-scenes video explaining how I coded the background music in Python using pitch and rhythmic Fibonacci cycles. So with that, I'll play you out using some of my very own Fibonacci music.